This is the lecture for intelligence. If you haven't already done so, please open the PowerPoint slideshow for mental ability intelligence. Intelligence is one of those uniquely psychological measurements. It was invented by psychologists for a very specific reason that I'm going to be talking about later. But not everyone is clear on what intelligence is or how we use the information from intelligence tests. Unfortunately, there are also several intelligence tests available out there that may or may not be accurate representations of a person's intelligence level. When psychologists think about intelligence, they think about a person's general mental ability, or more specifically, their mental aptitude. So intelligence is not simply a measure of what you know or the knowledge that you've accumulated, but also your potential for learning and understanding information. Oftentimes intelligence tests are not fact-based. They are more about problem solving, reasoning, and logic skills that underlie all forms of knowledge. On the first slide, you see different tests of mental ability, and I want you to be able to distinguish how we measure those different types. The first type of test, or the first category of tests, are known as achievement tests. Achievement tests measure a body of knowledge. In other words, they are a measure of what you know. For instance, in most public school systems, at certain grades, there are achievement tests that students must pass in order to progress to the next level or to graduate. These tests are meant to measure what it is the student knows to make sure that he or she has accumulated enough of the knowledge that he or she needs to earn a high school diploma. When you take exams in your classes, for instance, a psychology exam, most of the time those are also going to be achievement tests because they are tests on what you know or what you have learned in the class, the body of knowledge that you've accumulated. The other major category of tests are known as aptitude tests, and intelligence tests are one of those. Aptitude is an innate ability that you have. Most professional and graduate schools have aptitude tests that serve as entrance exams. For instance, you have the SAT, the ACT, the GRE, MCAT, LSAT, GMAT. These are all entrance exams designed to measure your aptitude or your potential for college or graduate school or medical school or law school or whatever the particular program might be. There are also specialized aptitude tests out there for different career options. For instance, if you have the aptitude to be a mechanic, if you have the aptitude to be a medical technician, some people do, some people don't to varying degrees, but an aptitude test will find out whether or not you have potential in those areas. Specifically, an intelligence test is a measure of a person's intellectual potential. So that measures both, to some extent, knowledge, but more how that information is used, how information is processed, and how information is applied. The range of intelligence scores varies greatly. We're going to talk about that in a little while. But just to let you know now, the average IQ score on one of the most popular intelligence tests is 100. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. That means you are of average intelligence relative to the population. For any of the tests that I've mentioned, it is critical that we talk about two characteristics of what makes a good test. Good tests, whether they are achievement or aptitude tests, have the characteristics or qualities of validity and reliability. Let me talk a little bit about reliability first. Reliability, in general, is the consistency of a measurement. That is, if I was to give you an intelligence test today, 
and nothing substantial happened to you intellectually between now and a month from now, if I gave you that test again, you should score the same. So reliability is the ability of a test to measure a certain trait consistently over time. If a test was not consistent, or in other words, not reliable, it would not be of very much value to psychologists and researchers. So a good test is reliable. We can test you again and again, and if we rule out any intervening events, your performance should be relatively consistent over time. Probably even more importantly is the characteristic of what we call validity. Validity is the accuracy of a measurement. In other words, how well does this test pinpoint your true ability? This is critical, and this is much harder to ascertain than reliability. For reliability, a researcher can simply look at your scores over time and make a determination about a test reliability. But for validity, to determine whether or not a score is accurate, most of the time, the only thing that researchers and psychologists have at their disposal is to compare your score on their test of interest with scores on other similar tests. If all of the tests seem to be pointing at about the same level, then we can say that a particular test is valid or accurate. By definition, if a test has validity, if a test is valid, if it is accurate, it is also reliable because for a test to be accurate, it must include the quality of being consistently accurate. So in psychology, we say that validity captures reliability. If a test is valid, it is also by default reliable. I want to give you just one example of the relationship between reliability and validity so you can understand how it works in the real world. I want you to think about a bathroom scale, a scale that you stand on to take your weight. Now if you step on that scale day after day, assuming you haven't changed your diet or exercise program, the scale is going to give you the same weight every time you weigh yourself. In other words, the scale is producing a reliable or consistent measurement. However, if it is a relatively inexpensive kind of cheap scale, there is no way to conclude that the measurement that it's giving you is actually valid or accurate. That is why sometimes people weigh themselves at home and they get a relatively reliable weight, a relatively consistent weight, and then they get a little surprise when they go to the doctor's office because the doctor's office is going to use a valid or accurate scale because it's much more important that they get an accurate measurement of your weight. So sometimes the difference between what's read on a bathroom scale and what a patient sees at the doctor's office might be a little shocking. So here is an example of where we potentially have a situation where a measurement is reliable but not valid. It is consistent, but unfortunately that bathroom scale is consistently wrong. So it is not valid. It is not an accurate measure. Before we get into some specific intelligence tests and what the scores mean, I want to briefly take you through the history of intelligence testing. If you take a look at the next slide, I just want to mention two important pieces of the history of intelligence testing. First of all, I want you to know about the history of the first intelligence test. This is known as the Binet-Simon intelligence scale. Binet and Simon were two French psychologists who were paid by the French education system to develop a scale with a particular purpose in mind. They were contracted to develop a scale that could identify children who were developmentally delayed. That is, children who would need extra assistance because they were behind intellectually given their age. 
So in 1905, Binet and Simon produced the first intelligent scale. What they decided to do was devise a series of tasks or skills or understanding that children at different ages should have. So there was a list of things that a three-year-old should be able to do, a list of things that a five-year-old should be able to do, and so on. What the child could do intellectually was given as his or her mental age. So in other words, if a child could do what was on Binet and Simon's list for age seven, but not age eight, that child received a mental age of seven. And then that was compared to his or her chronological or actual age. If a child's mental age was below his or her chronological age, he or she was said to be delayed and in need of some additional help or assistance to get caught up to where his or her mental age and chronological age matched. Now if you jump ahead for just a second, you can see some sample S Binet Simon items from the first intelligence scale. So as you can see, it's divided by age. By age three, Binet and Simon said that a child should be able to give the family name. In other words, their last name. Seems pretty simple. By age four, a child should be able to repeat three numbers that are said to him or her. And by age five, a child should be able to compare two weights. So if I put two things that have different weights in each hand, the child should be able to say which one is heavier or which one is lighter. So if you take a look down that list, you can see what Binet and Simon decided were appropriate age-related mental abilities, what people at those ages should be able to do. Now notice they actually do go into the um, pre-adolescent, adolescent years, and even adult. So take a look at what, sample, what Binet and Simon said about what an adult should be able to do. And let's make sure that your mental age is correct for adults. If you take a look at the next slide, you'll see just a few more items so you can begin to understand that Binet and Simon had a list of things that children at different ages should be able to do. Feel free to pause this lecture and read over these items. Some of them are kind of strange but you have to remember the context. This was 1905. This was the Victorian era. So some of them, their original measures are not used today. When you're finished reading through the items, go back to the slide that says history of intelligence testing. A few years later, the Binet Simon intelligence scale was imported from France to the United States where it underwent some significant revisions. Most of these revisions were done by a researcher at Stanford University. So in America, the original Binet-Simon scale was renamed the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale, and it was published in 1916. The researchers at Stanford determined that some of the items for younger children on Binet and Simon scale were a little bit too easy, and some of the items for the older children were a little bit too hard. So if you think about the implications of that, oftentimes younger children's mental ages were higher than they should have been, and older children's mental ages were lower than they should have been. So a mistake in either direction, either being too easy or too hard, would threaten the validity of this scale. The true purpose was to determine whether or not a child's mental ability matched his or her chronological age. So it was very important to make sure that items for all ages adequately represented what a child at each of those ages should be able to do. After this scale was published, there was development of an actual number for your intelligence measure. Binet and Simon did not assign an IQ 
or intelligence quotient to children. They simply reported what the child's mental age was. But here in America, we decided to take the measurement a step further. Once a child's mental age was determined based on testing, that mental age was divided by the child's chronological age. So for instance, a child can mentally test at age five, but be chronologically six. So we would take five divided by six, and then to put it on a scale of 100 points, we would multiply that quotient times 100. So that is where we get the modern day IQ, or intelligence quotient. Whenever you hear the word quotient, you know something is going to be divided. So in this case, it is a person's mental age divided by his or her chronological age, and then multiply that quotient times 100. That is why the average intelligence score is 100. This is the case in which a person's mental age is the same as his or her chronological age. They match. The person is neither delayed or below his or her chronological age in terms of mental ability, nor is he or she above his or her chronological age in terms of mental ability. So again, the average IQ score is 100. If the mental age equals the chronological age, when you divide those, you will get 1. And then 1 times 100 is 100. If you skip down through the Binet-Simon items to the slide that says calculating the IQ, there are some more examples of calculating the IQ that I'd like for you to take a look at. You may be asked at some later time to produce an IQ, but the division is very, very simple and straightforward. So let's take a look first at child one. Child one mentally tested using an intelligence test to be six years old. Chronologically, that child is six years old. So here's an example of what I just mentioned. Mental age is six, chronological age is six. So six divided by six is one, multiply by 100. This child's IQ is 100. He or she is average. Let's take a look next at child two. Child two mentally tested to the age of six. But this child is actually nine years old. Chronologically, he or she is nine. So if you take six, divide by nine, and then multiply that quotient times 100, you are gonna get essentially an IQ of 67. This child is below average. His or her mental age is lower than the chronological age. We'll take a look at a distribution of IQ scores in just a moment. But just know now, child two is below average in terms of IQ and may need some special attention in school. Let's take a look next at child three. Mentally, child three tested at nine years old. Chronologically, child three is 12 years old. So if you take nine divided by 12 and then multiply that quotient by 100, you get 75. Again, this is a child whose IQ is below 100. The mental age is lower than the chronological age, so when we do the math for the IQ, it's gonna come out to be less than 100. This child would also be in need of special assistance, particularly in school. For the last example, child four, we see a different scenario emerge. Mentally, child four tested at 12 years of age but this child is only nine. In other words, he or she tested higher mentally than his or her actual age. So here's where we see a flip in the IQ score. Mentally, the child tested at 12, but he or she is actually only nine. So you divide those, multiply by 100, this child's IQ is 133. This child would be considered gifted. So instead of requiring special assistance at school, 
this child may be enrolled in special sections or in gifted programs to capitalize on his or her superior mental ability. So again, child one is average, child two and three are below average, child four is above average, but the calculation is the same for each one. The technique for calculation, that is. If you take a look at the next slide, what you're going to see is a distribution of IQ scores. Again, this is based on common IQ tests in which the mean is set to 100. So if you look at the top horizontal line, you see deviation IQ score and you see 100 in the middle. And then you see some scores that serve as cutoffs for various categorical designations. Between 85 and 115, those IQ scores are considered to be average. So someone may have an IQ of 90, someone else may have an IQ of 112. They are all considered to be in the same category of average. Let's take a look next at the left side of the distribution. When a person scores below 85, that person is no longer simply average. This is getting to be below average. Once the IQ score gets down to 70 or lower, this person is classified as being mentally retarded. Once we get below 70, there are other cutoffs that serve as markers for the various forms of mental retardation or the various levels of mental retardation. The levels go from mild to moderate to severe to profound. Each of those levels might be associated with government assistance or benefits that a person can qualify for, but it is all based on that person's performance on an IQ test. So anything below 70 is considered to be mentally retarded. If you look on the right hand side of this chart, anyone who scores on an IQ test at 115 or above is considered to be superior. People who score at least 115 are considered to be above average in terms of IQ. Once we get to 130, people who are at that level or higher are considered to be gifted. Notice on this chart, nowhere is there a cutoff for genius. That doesn't happen in psychology. People may self-identify as being a genius, but we don't actually use that as a category of IQ scores. Maybe informally, but not on an official distribution like this one. So past 130, anything higher than that is considered to be gifted. What I would like for you to take a look at next, up at the top, you see the percentages of people who fall into each of those brackets. Most of us fall into the average bracket, the orange bracket here, 68.26%. So that means slightly more than two thirds of us are of average intelligence. I hate to say it, but most of us are average. Two-thirds of people are of average intelligence. Once you go out to the next bracket, 95% of people will score between 70 and 130. So we're getting to almost everybody here. Almost everybody who takes an IQ test, 95% is going to score between 70 and 130. If you go out to the farthest bracket, between 55 and 145, you will notice that that captures over 99% of people. In other words, 99.72% of people are going to score somewhere between a 55 and 145. So knowing this information, how likely is it that you are going to meet somebody who 
honestly scored 200 on an IQ test or 300 on an IQ test. I have personally heard some really high scores, but unfortunately I know a little bit about statistics, so I find that very hard to believe. Someone who claims to have scored 200 on an IQ test should be at MIT or should be at some other very high level institution. It is more likely that there is a bit of fabrication or the test that that person took is not a valid IQ test. So just keep that in mind if someone ever try, tries to use that line on you. It is highly unlikely that in your day-to-day -day goings about you're going to encounter somebody who has an IQ score higher than 145. Even a score of 145 is extremely rare to know. There is some other information that I'd like for you to know regarding intelligence. If you take a look at the next slide, it has some information on interpreting intelligence. The first thing I'd like for you to know is that there have been other ways in which intelligence has been conceptualized. Traditionally, intelligence was thought of as a general intellectual ability. One researcher referred to that ability as G, with one letter. We all have a G factor. G represents our general mental ability. Although Spearman, the person who created the idea of G, said that while we may have a, let's say, average G that underlies everything that we do, we may have superior intelligence in particular areas like verbal ability or music ability or interpersonal ability. In other words, G underlies all of our intellectual ability, but then we may have strengths and weaknesses in particular areas. Another theory of Spearman's is that intelligence can generally be broken down into two types, fluid and crystallized, because he noticed that on intelligence tests, older individuals started to have lower than average scores, and that didn't seem correct. In other words, it seemed as if IQ tests were biased against older individuals. So Spearman's conclusion is that we can divide intelligence into these two subtypes. Fluid intelligence is our aptitude or ability to process information our ability to multitask, our ability to follow directions and commands with ease without having those directions repeated to us. So in other words, fluid intelligence is the real-time cognitive processing that is going on. That tends to be higher in younger individuals. Processing speed does tend to decline with age. In other words, an older individual might have a harder time multitasking, might have a hard time keeping something in their head that they were supposed to remember, or may have a hard time following directions on something immediately. They might have to have it said to them a few times before they get it. On the other hand, we have crystallized intelligence. Crystallized intelligence is simply our ability to retain knowledge. So think about that as the, the file cabinet, the hard disk, the hard drive in our minds. Crystallized intelligence is our aptitude or capacity for retaining knowledge. This does not change with age. People have a good accessible ability to get to the knowledge that they know when they're young as when they are old. The difference is how quickly they can process that information and how many things they can simultaneously process. So using a computer analogy, again, crystallized intelligence is more of the hard drive. Fluid intelligence is more of your RAM memory, the processor, if you will. So for aging, fluid may be affected, crystallized is not usually affected. So that could help explain why people tend to show a little bit lower IQ scores as they age. It's simply because the IQ test isn't sensitive 
to those different kinds of intelligence. Another researcher had a completely different way of conceptualizing intelligence. Gardner believed that we have many distinct intelligences. There is not one general ability that underlies them all. If you take a look at the next slide, you will see Gardner's multiple intelligences model. He theorized that we have eight distinct forms of intelligence and everybody is either high or low on these particular areas. There is no one underlying overall intellectual ability. So I'd like to take a minute to go through each of these types of Gardner's intelligences. The first one that you see on the slide is visual or spatial intelligence. You probably already know if you are a visual person, if you are a visual learner, or if you are good with spatial relationships. On the other hand, you probably also know if you are not. So let me just give you some examples. Someone who would be high on visual and spatial intelligence. They're very good at using cameras and camcorders to capture a scene or capture a moment. They're good with jigsaw puzzles, mazes. They're good with laying out something, you know, laying out pictures on a wall, for instance. They are good at finding their way around unfamiliar areas. They are good at things like geometry. They may be good at drawing or painting. People with good visual or spatial intelligence may be able to design interior and exterior spaces with ease. And they may be able to mentally rotate shapes in space. So again, you know if you have this trait or not. The next one is linguistic, which is also known as verbal intelligence. You are good at picking up information by listening. You like word games like Scrabble. You are good with expressing yourself through writing. You are able to convince other people through dialogue or through writing. And you are good with public speaking. In other words, you tend to think and use words, where a visual person may tend to favor using imagery. So if you are a verbal or linguistic person, you will excel on tasks that require using and manipulating words. The next one is logical mathematical, and I know that you probably know whether or not you are good at math, but it is more than just math. Obviously, someone with high mathematical intelligence is very comfortable with numbers and computations, but someone who is high on logical mathematical intelligence would also be able to solve brain teasers that require logical thinking. You find logical flaws in things. You are able to use symbols to manipulate information. And you, are you have the ability to make deductions. You know, given certain details of an event, you can make a good deduction. In other words, all of these things that represent our ability to think logically, hierarchically, categorically, sequentially. That's a person who's high on logical and mathematical intelligence. The next one is musical. That one is also pretty straightforward, but it's not necessarily simply your ability to perform. People who have high musical ability may never have learned to play an instrument or sing. However, you can still tell when a musical note is off key, or you are able to reproduce a melody if you've heard it. Or you can hear, quote, hear patterns in a musical piece. So it's not simply just the ability to play an instrument, it is also the ability to understand the language of music. So according to Gardner, that's musical intelligence. Bodily and kinesthetic, this would be people who are agile, good at sports, and who are good at hands-on things. You build models, you're good at construction, you sew, for instance. 
any time that someone is good at using their hands or performing that requires a lot of physical coordination, such as dance, that would be an example of bodily and kinesthetic intelligence. Some people are good, some people are not so good. I'm going to skip over a second to intrapersonal. Intrapersonal intelligence is an interesting form of intelligence. This is your ability to be in touch with yourself, your ability to know yourself. You are able to set realistic goals. You are able to recognize your strengths and weaknesses. You are able to understand your own motivation for behavior. So in other words, someone who has good intrapersonal intelligence is really in tune or in touch with himself or herself. You know yourself. Usually these people tend to be reflective and a little bit more solitary because knowing yourself does take that effort to kind of unplug from everybody else and be introspective, to look inside yourself, to keep tabs on what's going on. Then, according to Gardner, we have interpersonal intelligence. Interpersonal intelligence is more or less social intelligence. You are able to understand the needs and emotions of other people. You are able to work with other people to achieve a common goal. You are able to seek out and understand someone's hidden agendas or motives. You make friends easily and you play social games like charades with ease. So you probably already know whether or not you have high interpersonal intelligence. There is a relationship between inter and intrapersonal intelligence. It tends to be difficult to balance both. People who are more interpersonal tend to be a little bit less intrapersonal because interpersonal means that you have to continually make connections with other people. You are exerting your energy outward. You are exerting your energy toward other people. As a result, you have less energy to be introspective and keep in touch with yourself. The opposite would be true for someone who is intrapersonal. If this is starting to sound like the personality traits of extroversion and introversion, you are on the right track. And when we talk about personality, you're going to hear more about those skills and abilities. People with high interpersonal intelligence tend to be extroverts. People with high intrapersonal intelligence tend to be introverts. Not always, but that's the trend. The last of Gardner's intelligences is called naturalistic or naturalist. And this one is probably the least well understood. The minute you hear naturalist, you think, okay, so a person with this intelligence knows all about trees and plants and animals in the forest. That's partially true. This person just tends to understand nature. They tend to have a green thumb. They can plant something and let it grow. When they have animals as pets, they tend to thrive. They just have an affiliation for natural things. But that's only one interpretation of naturalist intelligence. Naturalists are also able to see patterns in a scene. They tend to categorize things such as objects in nature, different kinds of rocks, different kinds of leaves. They tend to keep collections, scrapbooks, logs, journals, and this may be based on observations, drawings, pictures, photographs of specimens. So I'm sort of building a profile for you. People who are naturalists tend to have keen sensory skills they notice when things are wrong in an environment. So if you can think of one profession that may suit a naturalist, 
If you're thinking along the lines of forensics, you are right. People who have high naturalistic intelligence tend to do very well in forensics because that's what you do. You classify and categorize things. You have to be keenly aware of all the details in a scene and you have to notice when something seems out of place or wrong. All the qualities that someone in forensics would need. The last thing I want to mention is some of the shortcomings of intelligence tests. Intelligence tests are not foolproof. Even the most commonly used standardized tests available are not foolproof. No test is foolproof. Some of the issues that have been brought up regarding intelligence tests is that they miss a couple of things. There are a couple of things that may contribute to intelligence that we simply don't have the ability to test for or capture within the test. One of the main things or one of the main arguments against traditional intelligence testing is that intelligence tests do not measure a very important form of intelligence one that we might call common sense or street smarts. A person may have may score highly on all eight of Gardner's multiple intelligences but might not have any common sense about things. Traditional intelligence tests do not take that into account but of course that is certainly a measure of mental ability. Intelligence tests may or may not fully capture skill-based knowledge for instance, having an understanding of how a motor works or something to that effect or to be able to easily pick up on that. Some people can, some people can't. That may play into a little bit of bodily kinesthetic, but that's more working with those parts. Understanding how things work would draw from spatial, it would draw from kinesthetic, but it just seems to almost be a separate category in and of itself. Understanding how things work work. Another problem with today's intelligence tests is that it is very difficult to take into account environmental factors in someone's intelligence level. For instance, there is no way to factor in the effect of formal education. Some people are in school systems that have a wonderful education system, some are not. To some extent, people who are not in exceptional schools are going to show some detriment in IQ but it's simply not something that we can factor in so it really may not be an accurate test of their true mental ability it may just be that they are a product of a less than stellar school system and lastly today's intelligence tests do not take into account another extremely important environmental factor and that is the family factor does this person and usually we use IQ tests on children. Does this child come from a home and family environment that encourages learning, that encourages creative thinking, critical thinking, logical thinking, reasoning? By and large, children who come from families in which chronic use of your brain, chronic processing, tend to do better on IQ tests. That doesn't mean that children who come from families that don't stress that have any less of an innate intellectual ability. It is just harder to show on current intelligence tests because these tests tend to favor the ability to do the things I just mentioned. Creative, logical, critical thinking. And if it's not encouraged at home, once that child leaves school, it is not a skill that is practiced. And that may show in a lower test score on an intelligence test. So that ends the lecture for intelligence testing and mental ability.